Thanks, everyone. So um, before we get to Obama, Joe, uh -huh. uh, you started the business in 2004. What, tell, tell us about uh, what, what the start was. What were you doing back in 2004? Uh, the start was the catastrophic Democratic primary campaign of Governor Howard Dean of Vermont. So that launched your business? Uh, it did. We would not have had the chance uh, to launch a business had we not lost so quickly and decisively. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, we, uh, we How old were you at the, at the time? Uh, I was 22 at the time, uh, a couple years out of college. Um, but uh, the, 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 the business was really uh, started to make sure that that never happened again. Uh, and so it was um, on two, two fronts. One was to uh, integrate digital strategy uh, in, a, in a concrete way into the business outcomes that mattered for the organization, in that case, uh, caucus goers in Iowa, primary voters in New Hampshire, uh, and uh, to separately to build technology that got out of the way and at, at least and at best enabled and, and facilitated better strategies to get a whole, a whole bunch of people excited. And that was the, the big problem with the Dean campaign was we got a lot of people excited, um, but that didn't get channeled into a real business outcome for the organization. So, so how did you um, get roped into the Obama campaign, and, and what was the Obama campaign when you uh, were introduced? Uh, there was no Obama campaign uh, when I was introduced. I got pulled in because uh, right after we started the business uh, and Kerry lost the general election, uh, this same problem of, of a lack of excitement and, and uh, a digital and grassroots strategy as well as a, a big technology infrastructure problem existed at the Democratic Party. Uh, Governor Dean ran for chairman. We helped him with that. And when he, uh, when he won, he asked us to go in and basically clean house and start over uh, and hit reset at the Democratic Party. And so we did that. Uh, and we took the digital strategy, which had been sort of two guys in the basement writing a blog called Kicking Ass, uh, which was, uh, which was a, a decent blog, you know, as, as blogs went at the time. Um, but that was essentially it. And the guy in charge of uh, grassroots donations and, um, uh, and building the list of email subscribers was the same person who was responsible for making sure people had Blackberries that worked and that they had Microsoft Word on their computer. Uh, and that wasn't the right way to handle that. So we pulled it out of the basement uh, and created a new digital strategy uh, team outside the chairman's office on the third floor, built it from 2 to 12, hired the first designer to ever work at the party you know, to start building uh, digital assets. Uh, and it was uh, that foundation and a focus on uh, building a grassroots donor base and online organizing in all 50 states that was uh, a big piece of the success in 2006, uh, picking up a lot of uh, seats in the House and the Senate and governor's races in places that weren't So really this is expected. working for the DNC? Working for the so party, then, yeah. So then how did uh, Obama and so that was, find you guys? And that was on, it was on the on the basis of that, that we got the call from um, the Obama folks as things were starting to come together uh, in December of 06 and January of 07, and so got called in for an interview, uh, and I was one of the you know first dozen or so people hired. So I know uh, success has a lot of fathers, and uh, I'm curious, who were some of the other people that, that were the key members of that uh, startup team? basically a startup company. Uh. Yeah, I mean, David Pluff was the ringleader, and uh, David Axelrod uh, had obviously been with uh, then-Senator Obama for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, folks like uh, Jeremy Bird, um, who's a, you know, a community organizer who helped lead the, the field strategy, Mitch Stewart in Iowa. Um, and so that was a, it was a good group of folks, but also, you know, the characters, you know, Robert Gibbs uh, on the press side, things like that. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was interesting. I, I've had uh, opportunity to be at different events with uh, David Axelrod over the years, uh, and uh, at one recently, he <laughs> he very carefully said that he he was introducing me to a group of people and said, Joe is one of the people uh, who could plausibly claim to have made an impact <laughs> on uh, on the election of the president. It's quite a compliment. He's very careful. You yeah. Should have gotten yeah. that, that written down. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, we're here with chief digital officers. You were kind of the chief digital officer for the Obama campaign, two wins. But before we get to that, uh, what's happened since th those early days in 2007, I suppose, when you were getting started? Um, I mean, the things that have happened uh, since we started in the, on the first campaign, I mean, the iPhone came out during the first campaign. Uh, I remember losing a half a day of productivity from my uh, team because they all went and stood outside uh, the Apple store on Michigan Avenue. Um, and that was very aggravating at the time. Uh, but, uh, 
yeah, I mean, obviously everything's changed. The, the, the Facebook, uh, we, did, we didn't have a Twitter strategy in 2008. We didn't need one. Um, and obviously that was different in 2012. But, uh, but the Facebook platform, both on the uh, earned side and the paid side, has obviously evolved uh, incredibly. And, and the, the sophistication with which um, we can place our paid media for persuasion and for direct response purposes obviously changed uh, dramatically between the two campaigns. Yeah, I'm also interested in, in what's happened to you in the business. And, uh, uh, I heard a little something with WPP happened a couple of years <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, a little something. We're, uh, now, yeah. we're now cousins. <laughs> yes, <I> guess, uh. <laughs> cousins. Uh, yeah, we were acquired by WPP in the end of um, 2010. Uh, and so I got to have an uh, awkward uh, conversation with Martin and Mark Reed about uh, that I was leaving uh, a few weeks later to go run the 2012 uh, campaign. Um, but uh, we, we took on um, uh, we took on responsibility for the re-election, went out there, uh, I went out there, we moved a dozen people from Blue State out to the campaign and basically rebuilt our agency inside the campaign uh, with uh, a dozen key leaders in roles in social media, analytics, rapid response, organizing, uh, things like that. But, uh, but then we built a team of 300 around them uh, of new people who we brought into the campaign. And so uh, post-campaign, we've brought a whole bunch of those people back to Blue State, but also uh, the top draft picks, if you will, from uh, the 2012 team. But that's like an 18 month loss of, of, of uh, focusing on your business, right? I mean, uh, yeah, that's, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a, bi a big gap. So you told me, um, I hate politics, that's why I live in New York. So <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you rationalize that with these 18 month uh, departures every four years? Uh, I do hate politics, but I hate it even more when the bad guys are in charge. So um, we're, we have, uh, <laughs> we, we feel like we have an obligation to, to sort of push in when, when, uh, when we need to. Um, and so, uh, you know, and we've got, a, we've got a great team and, you know, we're about to cross 200 people at Blue State and um, it's a mix of a lot of talent that comes from political campaigns but also, you know, nonprofits and, um, and agencies and media companies and, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a cause aspect to what we do. A third of our clients are advocacy groups, uh, another third are nonprofits, uh, the, the, the last bit are, are brands and, and companies. Uh, and so I would expect that, you know, in, in 2016 you'll see people go out either individually as or as part of some plan from from Blue State, uh, not me though. Uh, okay, so with two Obama victories under your belt, what what were the lessons that you learned that you were able to bring to these advocacy groups and nonprofits and 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 other clients and brands? I mean, it's it's such an interesting opportunity, especially the re-election campaign. The the first campaign was much more of a, a really bootstrapped startup. Uh, we were forced to build, you know, for that first year of 2007 up to Iowa, just in those first four states. And so how does digital figure out with a really uh, retail politics? And then essentially we were the campaign in the rest of the country because there was no campaign. And so how do we uh, do something there, make sure we're raising money and getting people involved? But it was essentially three startups, you know, sort of before Iowa, Iowa through the end of the primaries, and then a, a really quick general election. In 2012, we got to build for 18 months ahead just for that one election day. And we got to use the financial resources that come with being the incumbent around and, and having the party to raise additional funds. Uh, and so we were able to build that scale uh, for a billion dollar enterprise from the start and to know that we were gonna get all the way there and that we would have the funds uh, most likely uh, to do that. And so uh, to have that, uh, that big, you know, open, you know, floor of an office tower in Chicago to say, okay, how are we setting this up? Uh, and to make budget and policy and uh, prioritization decisions around the opportunities that are very finite in that moment, uh, and knowing that you're going out of business in 18 months, it's a really, really interesting and useful exercise. So what are some of the things that you bring forward to non-political clients? Uh, so. Part of it is that organizational strategy of, well, if we could start from scratch, what, are, what, what would we do here? Uh, and the lessons that we learned going through that, just about how we all work together uh, and addressing the opportunities and trying to approach it from a digital first uh, perspective. Um, but also, I think there's, a, there's an element of the rapid response, the, the sort of political cadence is in our DNA, and so we bring um, uh, both from a content production perspective, but also from a, a rapid development of relationships with the people who are most important to you as they come in uh, perspective. Uh, we, bring, we bring a sort of quicker DNA. And, to and how, where, where are you basing those relationships on? Thing, social media like Facebook and Twitter and finding out about people? or uh, All of it. I mean, I think you know, we try to uh, 
uh, err on the side of the data that the client can own. Uh, so uh, in the case of the campaign, you know, we raised uh, $690 million online in 2011 and 2012. 65% uh, of that still came from email. Uh, about 10% came from social, but you know we flooded the zone on that to figure out how to fundraise on, on social with analytics folks and content and segmentation. And we think we did about all you could you could do. We did not do all we could do on, on email. And so the sophistication of uh, the data that a client owns and, and uh, the ability to have a more controlled contact is still where the biggest impact uh, lies. I always heard that fundraisers walking around a neighborhood would love to find a Subaru wagon with a Greenpeace bumper <laughs> sticker, and that was a door to knock on for contributions. What, what did you look for on a Facebook page or uh, a Twitter profile? You know, we, we were actually most focused on the, the data of our own interactions with people. And so if you signed up um, in um, a field office, uh, that's different than if you signed up online. Uh, if you came in on a first contribution and then lapsed for a long time, that we treated you differently. And so uh, it was actually less of a... Um, um, we did less matching for external third-party statistics for donor prospecting. It was all the, the nuances of individual clicks around our site or individual opens for our email uh, that we were able to, to get the most bang for our buck on segmentation. So um, kind of turning the question around, what, what kinds of things uh, have you learned broadening your business to these other clients that you took back to the 2012 campaign that you didn't have in 2008? Yeah, I think that's a really good, that's a really good point. We spent 2009 and 2010 taking the lessons from 08 out into the marketplace, somewhat speculatively, uh, about driving a more authentic relationship with your supporters uh, and, and the people who are most important to you, your top one to five percent of your customers, uh, building a truly digital first integrated operation across all your different lines of business and communication with supporters uh, or customers. And that was something that you know we weren't quite sure would work in the nonprofit world in every case, or uh, especially as we started uh, relationships with brands like Ford or, or Google um, or the Green Bay Packers, who we run fan engagement for uh, uh, still today after after four years. And so um, some, some clients were willing to Take a, take a risk on us and we were able to uh, refine our model uh, and our approach and our way of thinking through these different experiences. Because essentially we're looking at the same problem through all these uh, different types of projects. We're trying to better organize and orient an institution, an organization, uh, to have better relationships with the people who are most important to them and to provide real authentic communication and value to that end user in a way that will also drive business results. And that's the same work that we're doing, whether it's with Ford or the Packers or uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York uh, or the NAACP. But doing it in all those different places, and we have all of our staff work on those different types of clients. Everybody has a balanced portfolio across our different sectors. Makes us smarter for how we're attacking them. And so when it came time to start up in 2012, we actually spent much more time talking about the projects that we did in 2009 and 2010 than we did talking about what we had done in 2008. And um, so having some top clients like President Obama and Anna Wintour at Vogue and Lady Gaga, who, who's like the toughest uh, sell for you guys are trying to serve uh, up? I, I don't know. Raise your hand if you've been in a pitch meeting with Anna Wintour, you know, <laughs> alone in her office. I mean, that's, that sucked, <laughs> you know. Uh, that was, it, you know, it looks like it does in the movie and uh, it's... Uh, you know, you're told before you go in there that uh, you, you will likely have two minutes uh, before she throws you out. If you make it past, uh, you know, three or four minutes, uh, that means it went really well. Was uh, she wearing Prada? Uh, she, 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 was, uh, she was wearing sunglasses, um, but uh, it, was a very, uh, it was a very interesting conversation. But we wound up doing a, a great piece of work with them to essentially re-architect their business model online. And so to bring together um, the editorial and the business side and the consumer marketing side, which is um, uh, you know, run uh, in partnership with their parent company, Condé Nast, and to try to bring uh, the notion of, of their data together into one uh, uh, synthesized uh, system, but also uh, to look at the, the calendar of communications and the strategy about how to blend all of those things together it was a really fascinating uh, Project. And any difference between a U.S. presidential election and a presidential election in France 
or similar set of issues? The, the, the set of issues are, are different, uh, but um, uh, it was actually very interesting. We did uh, so we did the the presidential election in uh, France in 2012 uh, for the for the winner uh, Francois Hollande. Um, it was uh, it was surprisingly entrepreneurial because uh, I'm not sure that that's everyone's business experience when they when they go to France. But um, because of the presidential primary system that they have there, it's it's actually like ours. It's big open primary, so you are starting these organizations from scratch, uh, which is a big contrast to uh, Australia and Britain, where you're sort of going in with the party infrastructure uh, that you have already in place, and uh, that creates a different set of opportunities and, and challenges. But it was really fascinating. Uh, Fascinating campaign. And before we ask for questions, um, your website says, ask me about the time I was on 30 Rock. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, we need to change the website. <laughs> um, uh, I, was on, uh, I was on 30 Rock as a, a, a 30th birthday uh, present. Uh, uh, a friend donated to charity, and so we got to go sit for eight hours while they filmed, and I'm in the uh, audience uh, for the show within the show. Um, so that was, uh, it was, it was, it was a fun experience. Great. Well, I think we have a couple of uh, qu minutes for questions. We'd love to get some good questions from the audience with, with their full stomachs of full food. Anybody out there with a question? Yeah, in the back. Hi, Joe. I'm Brian Featherson Hoff from Ogilvy. Um, what was the difference in, in mobile and the impact of mobile between 20, uh, 2008 and, and 2012? Uh, was, it, it, was it a toy or a really big impact player in 2012 is my real question. So uh, it was a big impact player in, in both campaigns. Um, on the first campaign, uh, for organizational purposes pretty much exclusively, and by organization I mean field organization. Uh, and so uh, having the, the sort of uh, SMS tree and a set of um, automated but also um, tactical responses about collecting information back from the field in a way that you wouldn't uh, necessarily be able to. And this is, you know, in a er, smartphones less prevalent kind of, kind of moment. Um, and especially in places where um, you're trying to collect poll data, going through primaries in places where people don't have, uh, uh, you know, uh, smartphone devices was very useful. Um, in 2012, it was um, both organizational in the sense that, that we used it in 2008, except more sophisticated because we had a more sophisticated data system for how we tracked uh, our volunteers and our voters. But it also um, was a fundraising tool in, in 2012 in a way that it wasn't. And what we found um, was that for the people who saved their payment information uh, with the campaign, which we called, uh, we, we created a system called Quick Donate uh, that saved your payment information. You could uh, donate with one click from email or from the web or from mobile or social media. Uh, for the people who saved their payment information and who were on our SMS list, um, the response rate to SMS uh, contribution requests uh, was the highest among any channel. Uh, and so we would be getting uh, more than a dollar per recipient on that list coming back. Uh, because it was so easy, we would uh, make sure it was carefully timed in, in moments where we thought people would want to respond. But uh, the, the, the transaction was essentially, hey, you know, such and such happened, uh, text back the number you'd like to give and we'll charge your, sa you know, we'll charge your saved card. And somebody could just write back 5, 10, 25, whatever. some people wrote back 1,000. Uh, and, and that would just go and they'd get an email confirmation and it was that simple. Uh, and so that was something that people really, really um, took to. Do we have time for one more question? Hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. Sean Finnegan from C4. Um, two quick... C4 I'm right here. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, two quick questions. One, uh, I think it, maybe I misheard you, but on the allocation towards uh, social, mm -hmm. um, you had said 10%. I mean, the, the campaign's famous for the social initiatives with Chris Hughes and Facebook. And was uh, why was that percentage so low? And what sort of response were you getting from it? My follow-up question as a Bears fan is the Packers account pro bono charity work. <laughs> the Packers are the only publicly held uh, sports franchise uh, in the NFL. Uh, so they, they, ha they, they do have a grassroots thing, but uh, it is a ferocious uh, fan base in Chicago as well. Um, 
uh, the 10% number on social is the percentage of our fundraising that came sourced from social, not our allocation of our media budget. That was obviously much uh, higher in terms of our total digital spend. Um, but the, the mechanics of how you can interact with people uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and elsewhere, um, and despite having giant followings on all these platforms and actually a, an increasing uh, intense following on Tumblr, uh, which where we had more people at a raw n number count level interacting with our content than we did on Facebook or Twitter, uh, despite a lower, uni a smaller universe, um, was just that such that it wasn't you can't do all the things you need to do for for fundraising, and so we blew it out, made sure we understood the whole multi-channel donor experience, um, but uh, but that was a sort of a ceiling, and and so if you had get, if you had said to me, you know, at the height of the campaign when we were raising uh, money and when we were under pressure, you know, you can have five more people to work on that, I would throw them at email and overall donor segmentation and not at, at social. Okay, well, Joe, thanks very much. Yep. Enjoy talking. Thanks with you. very much. Cheers.